So, uh, I figure uh, let's change the pace a little bit. We've been talking a lot about simulcasting events specifically. Now let's talk a little bit about puzzle design for simulcast events. This is, uh, interestingly, I guess the third talk in my GC Summit puzzle theory series. Uh, and it's the third city that I've been living in uh, in three talks. So I was Portland the first time, Bay Area the second time, and now I'm back uh, in Seattle. Hopefully, uh, if I ever do one of these again, it's not gonna be from yet another city, but I guess if it is, maybe we'll have simulcast GC Summit coverage there too. Um, so here's the agenda for this talk. Uh, I'm gonna start with a Puzzle Theory Crash Course, but it's gonna be the super abbreviated version. If you kinda wanna dig deeper, uh, you haven't seen the first couple of talks. The talks are all archived online. I think, Curtis, they're on uh, snout.org and probably many other places as well. Yeah, okay. Um, and then we're gonna move on to what do I even mean by <clears throat> designing a portable puzzle? Why would you do it? Uh, how does one do such a thing? And then there are, I think, kind of some interesting puzzle community cultural implications to all of this simulcasting and portability that's going on right now. Uh, I think they're mostly good, um, and we can talk a little bit more about how to kind of keep some of this momentum going uh, for the good of the community. So <clears throat> here's what I mean by puzzle theory. Uh, it's kind of this half formal uh, study of the construction and solving of puzzles. It's kind of like what happens when you spend your time thinking about puzzles in a structured way. Um, and specifically comprises some methods for decomposing uh, the kinds of puzzles that we do, information reduction puzzles, into their component parts and steps. Uh, what I mean by information reduction puzzles, they're kind of the usual format for uh, the puzzles that we find in pretty much all of the events that we puzzle clowns do in our spare time. Uh, things like the game, uh, pretty much any old hunt. Um, even, uh, you know, the National Puzzlers League uh, weekend uh, extravaganza is, is a pretty good example of information reduction puzzles in many, many cases. Uh, the idea is that a solver is provided with an initial enormous pile of information. And the goal is to reduce the information content of that enormous pile to a word or a short phrase. Hopefully that all sounds super, super familiar. And from uh, that type of puzzle, they're actually, the, the, the theory, and we'll get to this, kind of indicates a few good uh, ways to approach thinking about portableizing these puzzles. So the most common structure that we see in an information reduction puzzle, and there are many, many, many other ways that they can shake out, uh, but the most common structure is that uh, first you kind of have to figure something out about the pile of data. You have to identify it, maybe identify some pictures that you've been given, maybe uh, figure out, um, identify the answers to particular sets of crossword style clues or uh, something like that. Transform usually takes the form of matching things up, maybe generating derivative data from that. And then finally, somehow you have to get from <clears throat> an information step and another information step and another one to an extracted final answer. Uh, and sometimes there's some recursion built in there. So uh, now uh, hold that in mind for just a second, and we have just a little bit more definition work to do first before we get to the, the very essence of this talk. And that is, now that we've talked about the puzzles that we do, let's talk about what do we even mean by portable puzzles. So portable puzzles are puzzles with a primary design goal. Uh, you go into the puzzle from the start thinking about how do I make this puzzle repurposable in some way. Uh, maybe you care about repurposing it so that it'll work just as well in multiple locations. Perhaps you repurpose it <clears throat> so that it will work uh, just as well in a different medium than it was originally designed to be um, uh, solved in. And maybe you design it with a flexible solution in mind so that you've kind of got uh, a puzzle that you can use, horrible example I suppose, but a puzzle that you could use for your brother's birthday this month and for a wedding uh, uh, anniversary you know, next month. Um, why would one do portable puzzles? So uh, many of the whys, I think, have already come up uh, during previous talks today. Uh, one of the biggest ones, and top of everybody's mind in the room, is events with multiple geographies. Um, this may be either simulcasting or event in a box. Um, there's not a whole lot of event in a box stuff that I've seen people do. Um, the uh, 
I guess maybe the closest example and probably what I had in mind when I was thinking about it, uh, when I was thinking about this list is um, the Shinteki Disney World experience, right? It's kind of like a... Okay, sorry, Disneyland. Yeah, let's bring this back to the West Coast. We're not, we're not quite there yet. Um, it, you know, so it's sort of this thing that um, can be run and rerun with uh, almost as handouts um, as, a, as a, an experience in a box. Um, and and portability, or des portability of design, I think, matters in that sort of experience. Uh, another case where portability matters that I've observed is, for, is designing puzzles for mass publication or republication. And uh, a, a place where I've seen kind of the most of this particular thinking, uh, most of us don't have opportunities to get republished in, or don't seek them out, get republished in Games Magazine and the New York Times. But uh, Lone Shark Games, a Seattle area game and puzzle company, manages to pull this off in a couple of forms. One, they, they get their annual uh, Gen Con hunt, which usually consists of a whole bunch of plaques and props and sometimes even segues that you drive around on the floor in a maze uh, that actually runs live at Gen Con as an over-the-weekend competition. Uh, but then they take, they take those uh, puzzles and to the extent possible repackage them as pencil and paper puzzles uh, that usually make it into the uh, the pulpy paper printed section in the middle of a games magazine. They also do a 10-foot crossword puzzle uh, at El Tana, which is a bagel cafe in Seattle. And um, I guess Mike Selinker, the, the Lone Shark president, was telling me uh, that they had a couple of interesting uh, challenges with having a 10-foot crossword puzzle on location. One, one is that uh, they thought they were originally going to have the solution actually go up on the wall uh, in, you know, in, in all of its 10-foot glory. But it turned out that people who got there and got the handout version of the puzzle uh, either after or while the solution was in the process of kind of being filled out on the wall, they didn't really enjoy sitting under a 10-foot spoiler. Uh, so now They've, they've changed their, their design just a little bit with more awareness of their uh, kind of location, I guess. And uh, now you sort of sit in the shadow of this 10-foot puzzle. Uh, the fact that the puzzle is a completely unsolved crossword grid doesn't really take away from the experience of having you know, a 10-foot puzzle and a 9-foot clue scroll hanging on the wall looming above you as you and, and, and maybe your, your friends are sitting at a table in the cafe solving the puzzle. And then finally, the, the, one of my favorite reasons why I think for portable puzzles is that as we start making puzzles more and more portable, especially cross-medium, you know, especially from, uh, well, and let me preface this with, I would never in a million years suggest fewer artifact puzzles, right? Like artifact puzzles, I think, are uh, exquisitely fun and a very, very important part of the game. But... Uh, having at least some thought put into how do we make these artifact puzzles work on paper, uh, I think that helps a tremendous amount with um, both with beta testing the puzzles as well as uh, archiving them so people can kind of share uh, shadows of the experience post-event uh, with their friends and, and with other uh, parts of the community. Uh, I think Dash's puzzle portability by virtue of the fact that they're writing an inherently portable event, uh, has made their archives among the most complete archives, at least for the two dashes that they've got puzzles posted for. I think they're working on dash three still. Um, it has made their archives among the most complete archives that I've seen for any event. And uh, you know, I, I don't mean to short sell uh, other efforts, I think, to post post game. Uh, archives, but Dash sort of gets the benefit, I think, of portability reinforcing this, this archivability. So when you're writing portable puzzles, there are a few difficulties that it's really easy to encounter. One is that you risk the less of depth and flavor to the puzzle, right? Like if you're thinking, okay, I want to take a puzzle, I've got a great location in mind, um, I want to write a puzzle specific to this location, and then at the same time, you've got this almost contradictory constraint in your mind, thinking about uh, how do I make sure that this puzzle can also play in other locations. Uh, there's a tremendous risk that it waters down the original essence of the location-specific puzzle. Um, additional difficulties include that uh, 
artifact production when you're trying to do a portable event is often more intensive. It's one thing for the original author who came up with a puzzle idea in the first place and is presumably quite passionate about this particular configuration of plastic bits uh, to have to sit down and construct 20 copies. Uh, it's another thing to hand off plans for those copies to 10 other cities and say, uh, in order for your teams to have the same experience as the originating city, uh, you guys are going to have to find somebody who's passionate about cutting and piecing together little bits of plastic. Um, can be done, but it, it, it adds to the complexity of pulling this off. And then finally, and a little bit relatedly, it makes uniformity uh, across all of the uh, separate, we'll say, implementations of the puzzle or of the event a little bit harder to pull off. Like, it's, it's one thing to say the components of the puzzle were identical, but it's another thing to say that the overall experience was it was uniform across all locations. Maybe, um, actually, I, Curtis gave me kind of a, a th well, something that sort of embodies, I think, a kind of thing here, and that is that uh, perhaps Portland, Oregon, is uh, one of the few places on Earth where Vancouver might mean something other than a city in Canada, <laughs> right? It might mean Vancouver, Washington, right across the river, practically suburban Portland, and. Uh, you know, a Portlander has to think, oh, they don't mean 400 miles away, they mean four. Um, and so, you know, just porting a puzzle to a different city can actually change the meaning of clues that look like they're crystal clear in, in their intent. So uh, now to sort of tie this back to the puzzle theory intro that I gave at the front, if we remember that most of the information reduction puzzles that we spend our time thinking about uh, take the form of identify, transform, extract. The, uh, there are a couple of those steps in particular that one can often uh, approach as sources of, of flexibility in a puzzle. Sometimes the identification step, you can actually just substitute alternate data. Um, maybe for this room, uh, we could have had a puzzle with a picture of you know, several of the different walls um, this is an awful puzzle idea. Nobody, it, 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 I'll be disappointed if anybody ever implements anything like it. But uh, imagine that you know pictures of different walls ended up conveying directions for a semaphore clock. Uh, it would be very easy to also take identical pictures f facing similarly uh, in the picture down in the room down in Mountain View that you guys are all sitting in, and uh, the rest of the puzzle could have proceeded identically, uh, given just a change in. Uh, the identification step. Finally, or, or next, uh, in, in the final stage of the puzzle, in the extraction step, uh, it's entirely common uh, to have it, some sort of indexing or sequencing operation where you end up extracting just tiny little convenient pieces from uh, maybe parts that you got during intermediate steps, uh, sometimes with indexes, um, sometimes with other dereferencing operations. And there's often a place to be able to pull, uh, make some changes there. Uh, one other place where we very often change the outcome from having solved a puzzle is that we uh, sort of take an indirection step through some sort of oracle. Many games have some kind of electronic device that has some sort of awareness of time built into it. Uh, we type in our final word or short answer in uh, stark contrast to kind of the game tradition, I guess, that was portrayed in uh, the Disney movie Midnight Madness, where uh, pretty much every clue resolved as, you know, a direct textual pointer to next place to go. Uh, nowadays, you know, our answer is avocado. You type that in and it's here, go to, this, the, go to these GPS location, the, these GPS coordinates in, in the following park. Um, and then, uh, Baffle has kind of a, an interesting, that's the Boston, uh, I, I can't do the acronym expansion, but it's the Boston area hunt tradition that's kind of uh, evolving these days. They have puzzles that operate in two modes, hard mode and normal mode. I think the most common difference isn't actually a difference in the execution of the puzzle so much as how much explicit instruction is provided for the aha steps. But the point is that they put uh, first order thought into their puzzle designs to take into account being able to sort of flip a difficulty switch on every single puzzle that they ship. 
All right, uh, if, if puzzle theory doesn't help you come up with any, any good, good things to think about for, um, uh, portable, making, for porting your puzzles, then uh, there are some other things to think about. You can embrace geographic variation as an asset instead of as something that you have to work around. Uh, so I think Dash did a really good job of this in Dash 3, I think it was Dash 3, having the uh, scavenger hunt photos that teams had to take and post to Twitter uh, kind of as they went along the path during the day, and then having those uh, geographically distributed scavenger hunt photos feed into a final, final meta. And um, another, another thing one could do is imagine that you've got six teams in six different cities in uh, six different locations, but at the same time, you could either using some mechanism like Twitter or even putting teams in, in contact with each other via phone, Google Chat, something like this, uh, and have physical elements of each of those six locations feed into each other's experience of the puzzle. Um, this is kind of a special case thing. I, I don't know of any particular, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen any particular implementations of this sort of thing. Um, but it, certainly a way to do it would be tie together uh, physical elements from multiple places. It's possible also to use uh, basic uh, requirements but leave the specifics flexible. Um, so uh, a good example, I guess, from the Who game would be that there was a very, very karaoke clue. Um, but it turns out that it doesn't have to be any particular karaoke bar. Uh, you kind of just need some kind of uh, relatedly karaoke style theming. Um, another completely made up example could be, hey, this clue doesn't need anything in particular, but maybe we need 20 different beers on tap, and the answer is going to be one of those, one of those beers by name. Um, so additionally, you can enable portability by, by degrees. The, um, again, I guess to pick on Dash, uh, who's done a lot of portable puzzles, turns out, they had a couple of puzzles that come to mind here uh, where various cities implemented the physicalness of the puzzle to different degrees. There were actual beer bottles in some cities and there were pictures of beer bottles on a piece of paper in other cities. And there were um, actual tombstones in some cities for the tombstones puzzle and even actual graveyards, I understand, in two cities. I think here in Palo Alto, yeah. Uh, and, and not actual graveyards in many other places. And then if all else fails, uh, you can do you can replicate parts of the environment for the original location uh, on paper or electronically. Uh, you know, imagine building a 3D panoramic photo, something like this, uh, or 360-degree three, panoramic photo of something, and saying, you know, hey, uh, here's what you would see in the original location. The rest of the puzzle is still fun. Uh, knock yourselves out. And I would note that that approach is useful for both test solving the puzzle in the first place so that you don't have to send every single test solver to the physical location. Uh, and in fact, you yourself don't have to go back to the same physical location every time you want to retune the puzzle. Um, and it's also for online archival post event. Which now brings us to uh, cultural implications of writing portable puzzles. I think portable puzzles help our whole community and I think we're seeing a lot of this in action right now. Uh, I think they help alleviate the content shortage, right? Like all of these, or at least in this case, maybe I can't claim portable puzzles, but portable events, presumably comprised of portable puzzles, whether they were designed explicitly that way or not. Uh, and, and these simulcasts, I think, are helping bring puzzle events, high quality puzzle events, to more and more and more people. I think they're enabling cross-pollination and reinforcement of existing puzzle communities. And at least one story uh, that Debbie Goldstein was telling me about Dash is that it seems that Dash, uh, maybe some other things, but you know we've heard stories of Dash helping out, uh, actually bootstrapping a probably soon to be vibrant puzzle community in Chicago. Um, there may have been other stuff before, but I understand that there either was or is soon to be a Who recast in Chicago. Uh, and I also uh, understand that there have been some other just spin-off events, like some guy got bored and wrote a, a hunt that was set in a museum up there just for fun. And uh, what got him impassioned was his experience with Chicago Dash. 
So, uh, you know, the, the, obviously, the more cities we have building stuff like this, the more opportunities we're going to have to do the slightly easier work of recasting rather than writing from scratch events uh, around here uh, to sort of fill in times between, uh, you know, the, the big high production value local, local events. And, um, and I've already hit on probably the archival and sharing point plenty. Uh, and I've already plugged Dash, but um, Dash is coming up April 28th. Uh, you should sign up for it if you haven't already. And I understand from talking to Jeff earlier today that we're still looking for uh, GC in Seattle. Uh, so if anybody is interested, contact uh, Debbie. Yeah. And okay, this isn't an and, this is a but. So, you know, we've talked about writing portable puzzles, but don't let attempting to write portable puzzles because you've heard from some clown in a shark shirt that it's the right thing to do stop you from innovating uh, the way you normally would with puzzles. Um, you know, every, every event is going to have different design goals. Every particular puzzle comprising each of these events is going to have different design goals. And we definitely, definitely don't want to see good practice trump innovation in, in this community. Uh, here's some community resources plugs since we're on the subject of community. Um, there's uh, Scott Royer's Puzzle Hunt Forum, although I think these days um, maybe Facebook is kind of subsuming uh, a lot of the activity that we saw happen on those sort of things. I know at least up in Seattle, Bay Area, are there places that you all hang out? Um, Facebook or otherwise? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that definitely counts. Um, Puzzle Hunt Calendar, and uh, there's, I don't know how many of you have heard about Stack Exchange. It's, it's kind of a spin off of the website Stack Overflow, Server Fault, Super User. Um, you have, you've got a good chance of having heard of at least one of those three. Um, Stack Exchange is kind of like, Q&A, wiki, forum, public, creative commons thingies for uh, any particular special interest you can kind of imagine. There's a proposed Stack Exchange site for puzzling, but as you can imagine, there aren't as many puzzlers on Earth as there are programmers or server administrators or uh, even, it turns out, Mathematica enthusiasts. Uh, and so the site is, the proposal is having a little bit of trouble getting uh, excitement, but if that sounds at all exciting to any of you, you should go support it. Uh, I, I, I am supporting it enthusiastically and hope it takes off. And then uh, just because I, it's hard for links in a, a slideshow to get used, uh, I'll go ahead and post a roundup of all of these links on puzzlepro.com. And with that, I will open the floor to questions, comments, rants, whatever. So I totally agree with the um, issue about Vancouver, Washington versus Vancouver, BC, uh, but it didn't sound like, um, I didn't quite catch your suggestion of what to do in that case, right? If I have a puzzle and I've written it thinking I'm living in Portland, um, what are the things I ought to watch out for and how, how, I, how, I, how should I portableize that puzzle? Right. Portableize the Vancouver clue. Yeah. Um, it's really hard. You're right. If you're not, to, to pick on this concrete example specifically, it's really hard if you're not uh, from Southern Washington or Portland, Oregon, to be, I guess, aware of that particular clue breakage. But I think that um, there was actually, when I was talking to um, Debbie about uh, just kind of her thoughts in general on portable puzzles before this talk, um, one of the things that she said is it's really important to play test everything in every single city. Um, you can't just count on one play test in one place uh, shaking out all of the issues that you're going to find in all of the other locations as well. And of course that's partially because of exactly these sorts of uh, almost literal localization issues, but it's also um, that you know more eyeballs are better and if you've got a uh, a two-city event, uh, two sets of beta test eyeballs are definitely going to uncover more. Um, and, and the contexts just are very subtly different. And I think the composition of the people in every one of these puzzle communities is, uh, is going to be, you know, different. Uh, I think on the West Coast, we're prob we've probably got a whole bunch of computer scientists around. And I, I'm, if I had to guess wildly about Chicago's puzzle scene, 
you know, sure, some computer scientists, but I bet there's a big uh, academia contingent there as well. Lawyers, bankers, Erwin suggests, yeah, um, and so on. Just a quick comment. You mentioned about Dash 4. Signups aren't up yet, and uh, we actually do have a Seattle GC now. Mike Selink the aforementioned Mike Selinker has uh, volunteered to GC up in Seattle. Woohoo! Okay, super. All right, so apologies to the Dash folks for spreading rumors. Well, no, it wasn't a rumor. They hadn't told us that yet. They told us to keep looking for his GC. All right, all right, all right. No, on Facebook they yeah. said it's been taken care of. Uh, they Comment on the Vancouver question. When you're, when you're designing a puzzle, one of the things to keep in mind is whether or not a clue is locally unique versus globally unique. In Seattle, if you talk about a really big software company, people are probably going to go to the right place. But if you go to Chicago, there may not be anything that qualifies as the obvious really big software company. Whereas, so if you're trying to clue Vancouver, if you clue it by name, that's maybe locally unique. If you clue it by GPS coordinates, that's globally unique. That's, that, that won't change anywhere in the world. So you can pick that as a point and know that it will port. So anytime you're thinking about clues, it's like, well, this clue is unique here. Would it be unique anywhere? This clue, this clue would be unique anywhere. And that, that makes it more portable when you're looking at clue design. Cool. <laughs>